So um, the reason I do this work before we get started is because I spent most of my life completely crippled by fear. Of course, we don't, you know, go to school to become a fear strategist, right? I've started my career on Wall Street and finance, and then I moved into freelance writing, which I've done for 25 years. I wrote a book about parenting, you know, in 2009. So I have a lot of different things that I've done, but the one common denominator throughout my life and career and life was I was crippled by fear-based thinking, and I didn't understand it. And so over the last decade, I spent a lot of time researching how humans navigate fear, why, how it holds us back, how we navigate it, how it manifests in our lives. And, um, and that fuels my, 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 re my content. So like three years ago, I launched a consultancy to help people do this. And I did it thinking I was targeting midlife women because at the time, those were all the people that were talking to me because I had just gone through a divorce. So all these women were talking to me about all their fear. And I said, wow, there's sort of a problem here. These women could use some help. So I put my research together with my business experience and my writing experience. And I launched my blog and, and website and consultancy. But what happened was that's not how things turned out. And as you, any of you who are entrepreneurs know that in a journey of entrepreneurship, you discover sometimes what your business is rather than you know, sort of set out to, to, to put into practice a business model that you came up with. So I work with corporate teams. I work with leadership teams. I work with huge retailers and financial services companies and all different people helping them understand fear, how it manifests in their work and their lives and how they can reframe their thinking about it. So that's a little bit of my backstory. I'm going to share my screen now so we can get started on the workshop. And I would, I encourage you if there's something, as Malou said, if there's something that you want to, you know, talk about or ask a question about, interrupt me, that's fine. I, I don't, you know, it doesn't, this is not formal. And I like that there's a small group because we can engage with each other. This is a topic that's pretty, uh, universal, whether or not you have a business, like Tina was saying, she doesn't, she's not, you know, here because she necessarily wants to talk about her business. But it, I find that this topic is pretty universal. So if there's anything that you want to sort of stop me on, feel free. So how to navigate doubt as you build your business. Um, the one thing that we, this past year and a half has given us on a silver platter is uncertainty, right? We don't, whether or not you're starting a business in a corporate machine, working you know, in the career you've been working on, but now you're hybrid or you're at home, or there's just so much uncertainty and with uncertainty comes fear. And what I'm finding is people don't really even know what is considered normal anymore. And I bristle at the phrase, the new normal, because I don't think there's a new normal. I think we're just all trying to figure it out as we go along. Um, so what I'd like you to do, this will come in handy a little bit later, is if there's a looming fear in your brain right now, something that's really pressing on you, write it down. Uh, not necessarily in the chat, although you're welcome to, but just write it down somewhere. Um, and we'll circle back to that. And if anybody wants to share right now something that brought them here today or something that's really under their skin, I encourage you to do that. Uh, and Malu, if anybody says anything in the chat, just shout out. Sure. Did somebody say something? No, okay. So fear, that's why we're here. I just wanna talk about the word for a second because it, we have really been socialized to think of fear as something bad. Uh, we've been socialized to think of fear as something that we have to battle, you know, conquer. You hear this all the time. Fearlessness is the goal, right? Do it anyway. All of these kind of, you know, concepts that we've been, uh, have been ushered to us through social media and all different things. And this concept of conquering and overcoming fear is just, very contrary to my belief after you know doing all the research that I've done and 
and also my own experience with fear-based thinking. So my working premise is fear is fuel for change. It is a springboard from which you can make effect really positive change in your life. Fear tells you what you need to know, pretty much everything you need to know. So if instead of trying to conquer and battle those fear-based thoughts, we unpack them and notice them and understand them, <clears throat> we can then reframe them. Um, now, to do that, the first thing that I do with many of my clients, if not all of my clients, is dig in to their unique fear journey. And by that, I mean everybody has a unique relationship with fear. And, it's, and it is cultivated through our experiences, our first family dynamics, that's a big one, you know, how we've been taught, what's been modeled to us, the memories that we have, and all the relationships that we've, you know, developed through our lifetimes. So it's kind of a, a roadmap that's unique to each of us uh, that informs us about how we relate to fear. And once, I, once people can unpack that and understand it, they can get a lot further along in reframing fear-based thoughts because we get really good in life at stuffing these things down. And then we assume because we age, they disappear. They do not disappear. And I am not a therapist and do not purport to be one, but I have worked with many in my life, uh, you know, clinicians, doctors, therapists, coaches, and it all starts at home. So I do a lot of work with people on this part of, you know, mapping out their fear journey. And obviously we're not doing that today. It's not the right, venue for that, but it's important to give you context about how the strategy that I'm teaching you later works. Um, it, it sort of circles back to your knee-jerk feelings about things, and that all starts um, from your own history. But what we're talking about today is, is fear and the big why, and how this also affects your relationship with fear your relationship with your bigger purpose. And whether it's, you know, specifically to do with a new business you're starting or work that you do professionally or your life experience, this, this kind of mindset can help you shift out of fear-based thinking instead of getting marinated in it. So that's kind of the angle we're going to come at it today. Um, and, and I will teach you an actionable strategy you can use um, a little bit later, and that's where your fear is going to come in. We're not talking about this. So in every workshop and presentation I do, I do a little quick back-of-the-envelope science lesson about what types of fear there are and how we react to those fears. This lion in the room, tiger in the room, spider on the wall, dark alley, this is fight-or-flight fear, right? And this actually originates in a part of the brain called the amygdala, which is at the base of your brain stem, two almond-shaped structures on either side. That is what's triggered when you see a tiger in the room. When, and, and when your amygdala is activated, guess what? The top part of your brain, the gray matter, the cerebral cortex is not activated. Why is that? If you're standing on the train tracks and a train is coming towards you at 100 miles an hour, are you going to weigh your options? No. We are wired, <laughs> hardwired to get out of the way. And that wiring is what has allowed us to survive as a species. Because if we spent time thinking about it, we would all have been eaten by the tiger. So the amygdala gets activated the cortex kind of shuts down, and that's why when you get in that fight or flight scared, you, you can't really think straight. You forget things, you can't remember your lines, you can't remember you know, what you were gonna say. So what we're talking about is the cerebral cortex, the fears that originate here. And what are those? You know what they are. This kind of stuff, right? How am I gonna do this? Who, I'm kidding myself. You know, the imposter syndrome, the inner judgment, all of these thoughts, anxieties, things that we steep in that don't help us survive. On the contrary, they keep us stuck and often get in the way of us doing the thing we want to do, trying the thing we want to do, speaking up, advocating for ourselves, 
whether it be to a boss, a colleague, a partner, a friend, a family member. So that's our quick little science lesson. And the good news is the kind of fears we're talking about are fear-based thinking, right? Thought patterns that emerge from these, these deeply rooted fears, but thoughts are choices. Feelings are not choices. Feelings happen and we can't control them. Thoughts are choices that we make all day, every day. And we can choose different thoughts that serve us better. Scientists call it neuroplasticity. You know, it's widely understood, and I'm sure you, you all understand this, that when you learn a new skill, you create new neural pathways in the brain. Your brain grows, essentially, if you learn how to play an instrument or a new language, how to drive a car. These things, these skills create new neural pathways and your brain essentially grows. But research in neuroscience has shown us that when you think about doing the thing, when you think about trying something new or think about something, you know, a new experience, your brain wiring changes. Now, and that's called neuroplasticity. That's fascinating, right? And, and the way I like to kind of position it is, it's like Dorothy and the Ruby Slippers. She, she had the power all along, she just didn't know how to tap into it. Neuroplasticity is a little bit like that. It's kind of like a superpower. Like we all have the power now to change our experience by changing our thoughts. And I'm not talking about, you know, poly, I'm not talking about positive thinking and just being, you know, I'm talking about real neuroscientific change by choosing different thought patterns, not conquering, battling, crawling over the top of the fear, understanding it, and then choosing different thoughts around it. So this is such an issue, you know, in my work, I, you know, became aware early on of the, pardon the expression, the epidemic of fear-based thinking and how it can really get people stuck in dynamics that don't serve them, in whether it be relationships, work, place, the relationship with their self. So I created a, a digital course called The Fear Formula, How to Get Unstuck and Lean into Courage, in which I teach these actionable steps for reframing fear-based thinking. Find, enlighten, accept, and reframe. Because these are the steps necessary to, like other new skills, to practice so that you can then knee jerk to the thought that serves you. And then that leads to behavior that serves you rather than to the thought that holds you back. So I'm gonna pause for a minute because there's a lot of words, a lot of stuff. And I would like if anybody wants to just share the fear that they're thinking about as I'm talking today. So we have a little bit of context and we can know a little bit about each other. Anybody willing to do that? Come so on. Nancy, I'm willing to do that. Oh, right. <laughs> a girl. I'm not really a fearful person. So when I signed up for this, it was like, okay, I look, I attend Haven stuff every week. Every week I look for some enlightenment stuff that I can break up my home time. And I say, okay, what the heck? I may as well listen in. Um, the first thing I wrote down is right now alternatives. Prior to COVID, I had been a financial advisor, worked for Merrill, left Merrill, worked for AXA, COVID hit, financial advisor starting over or building the practice, not the best thing. So I literally sat in my a home office and I looked at everything that I have had in my hands throughout my career, been at IBM, high level consulting companies, et cetera. So right now you said choices and I wrote the word alternatives. I sit here now, I get a lot of opportunities to probably go back into corporate America and be a, a delivery director, delivering IT business services, or um, I've been a serial entrepreneur forever. So I talk about financial literacy and I've been getting lots of opportunities to speak. I'm doing six speeches this month, University of the West Indies, Pace University, my two alma maters, et cetera. So I sit here and 
I get job opportunities and I get speaking opportunities and I'm coaching people to be better leaders, et cetera. And I'm like, which way do I go? So that's where I sit right now. So it's not fair really. And when you talk about fight or flight, um, I grew up with a father who said life was a battle. And then as a black woman in corporate America came here from the Caribbean work for IBM, I just did a speech on my price and pain and dignity, pain and price and dignity, 18 years at IBM. So my dad always said life was a battle. So when you put up that tiger in the room, my first approach is let's fight. So that's basically me. Alternatives, where okay. do I go? That, that the, walk in really, the road. Yeah, that's really interesting. And thank you for sharing that because it is, it is so fascinating to me how this topic can sort of feed into so many different areas of life. And, it, and you're right, Stacia. Is it Stacia? Am I saying that right? No, it is Stacia. So think of the C, it's Stacia. Stacia. Okay. Not stasis, though. Not well, stasis. Well, I, I, get, I get everything. My <laughs> siblings say stasis when they want some favor, so. Um, so as a person who's had the journey that you've had, you know, you, you actually are the poster child for what the kind of thing I am talking about. It's like tapping into your unique relationship with whatever this word means to you. It doesn't have to mean, you know, anything in particular. If for you, it triggers the thought choices, you may not be fearful of making choices because you have an abundance of choices, but maybe you're, you're not struggling, but the challenge for you is tapping into what you really want and how that translates into what you choose, right? And, and my finances, because what I really want is to talk and do workshops and teach people financial literacy, but I live in Fairfield and I got to pay my bills. So it's mm -hmm. the, <laughs> so it's yeah. that. Access. <laughs> yeah, and that's a that's a that's a that's a relevant point I think for everybody too because right now especially it's the data shows us the disproportionate number of people who are thinking of changing careers or leaving their job. I mean that is fact and it's stunning how many people are considering doing that because of all of this kind of dissatisfaction that's been brewing, but this pandemic has underscored it. So I don't want to go off in too much of a tangent, but I will say that it is it is really helpful for people to start to entertain how they can scratch the itch, your financial literacy, which is such an important topic, and how ways that you can do that without jumping ship and, and not paying your bills. And I think, again, I, I always like to talk about how that side hustle can happen. There's ways to do it. There's ways to dip a toe in. There's so many outlets now, so many opportunities to get mm -hmm. a little bit of exposure here, a little bit of exposure there. Get collaborative partners that you can work with. We can talk about that offline. But okay. but, but thank you for sharing that, that thought with us because they are all very aligned with what we're talking about today. Anybody else have some thoughts they want to share before I move? I keep going? No, good. Okay. So we're talking about the why and how tuning into your why, tapping into your why can help you navigate fear-based thinking, not to the detriment of the what and the how. And, and this follows with what we were just talking about with Stacia. You know, what and how are important. You know, how are you doing your job right now? How are you providing for yourself or your family? What are you doing and with integrity? How are you doing what you're doing with integrity? The key is to not make those things eclipse the why, not allow them to eclipse the why, because then you get stuck in fixed mindset where it's all about logistics, it's binary thinking, it's black and white, it's win or lose, and you, and you lose sight of sort of the greater purpose behind it. What is it, and if you're an entrepreneur, what do you want to solve and who do you want to solve it for? Without that piece of information, you're you're kind of all over the place, and you you're not grounded. Um, if you're working in a job in the in the corporate uh, hierarchy, why do you do that job? Is it just because you want to keep getting a paycheck, or is there something that draws you to that work? 
And if you're unhappy there, is that thing that draws you to that work applicable elsewhere? So there's so many different ways to approach this, but I want to I want to stay aligned with our discussion today in that the why and staying grounded in that why can help you when fear-based thoughts bubble up, can help you elevate out of them. And I'll explain more. So let's just, if you don't want to share in the chat, you just want to write, what's your what? What, what do you do right now? What is your job? What, what is your uh, role? Anybody want to raise a hand? Yvonne, hi. Hi. Hey, hey, hey. Um, well, I have a podcast called Late Bloomer Living, which right now is a passion project that I'm hoping to monetize around at some point. But the mission is to have people, have society rethink the way we think about aging and to embrace the idea or the, the possibility of midlife reinvention and beyond. Okay. So that's we're going right to the why. That's your why. And I love that. All right. Stacia, what's your why? My why is to help women to um, have a better quality of life, particularly minority women, better quality of life through financial literacy and financial wellness. Okay, beautiful. Virginia. Oh, you're still muted, dear. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I, I'm struggling right now with my why. So I think that that's interesting. Um, I think I had a very clear why when I started my, my business, which was to help people navigate the exploding streaming space um, and save them money. And now, you know, I, I, that's still important to me. I'm trying to think, you know, I'm trying to figure out ways to evolve it. But um, I think I have other whys as well. So I'm, I'm struggling with that. Okay, thank you for your honesty. And I will say that that sounded a little more like a what than a why. So maybe part of the struggle is that you're in the what space and you wanna to get to the why space. So that, and again, happy to talk with you offline about that, but that, that's interesting. And I, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, Julie, hi, Anne, Julie. Are you in the middle of something and can't unmute? Well, maybe not, that was unfair. She, I think she said that she was doing something. I can talk, but can you remind me what the question is? Yeah, what? So curious, what your why is? If you if you're running a business, if you're working in corporate hierarchy, if you're doing neither of those, what is the thing that sparks you? What is a, a problem you'd like to solve? What is your bigger why? Oh um, well, right now I'm not working, and I'm looking for employment. Um, so. I feel like I'm kind of, kind of trying to overcome my fear. And I came from like a corporate accounting background. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to overcome the fear of like, do, do I go back to the corporate world? Like I can, but like, is that the expense of my health? Um, am I able to, you know, manage my stress and um, feel confident and capable of completing all my work? Or like, should I try to pursue something like entrepreneurship or build something that is like for me and for other people. Oh, you're at a beautiful crossroads. You're at, you're at, you're at that great crossroads of, of figuring out what sparks you. It's like fertile confusion. It's like, you know, <laughs> that's a, that's a very cool place to be. So I hope that you'll embrace that space because, and I'm glad you're here today because this is exactly what we're talking about. Thank you. I'm trying Nancy. Yeah, it's all we can do. Um, Anne Wood is here. Anne, do you want to share a why? Sure. I um, My why, I'll start with my what. I'm a financial advisor and work uh, with a, a firm that deals directly with doctors. And my why is really loving to work with doctors because they give so much to us, especially through COVID in the last year. I've always been attracted to 
um, the medical field. And this is a way for me to transition my career into something new and different after years of travel and management. And, you know, I just wanted something new at this stage in my life. And it was a great opportunity to walk into something where I could use my organizational expertise and sales ability towards educating doctors on their finances. That's that's great. So everybody's tap, tapped in, you know, pretty tapped into what sparks them. And that is such an important place to be. Um, did I did I hear from everybody? Did I miss anybody? Tina, do you want to share something or? Um, so recently I left my position as the chief operating officer uh, at Columbia University in um, the healthcare arena. Um, and basically I left that position and I'm in a state of, of why. <laughs> I'm not really sure what I want to do next, if I want to resume another high pressure job in healthcare or if I want to transition to something else. And I guess along with that, there are concerns that come up. I mean, a lot of common threads um, I heard from the women who spoke previously. I'm concerned about things about whether or not I will find another job, whether ageism is going to work against me whether I'm going to be pigeonholed um, in a certain arena. So that's sort of where I am now. Okay. That's really helpful to know. Um, and everybody's got sort of a different, coming at this from a different angle, which makes it a rich discussion, right? So let's, let's keep going and we'll circle back to some of these things. Um, so when we talk about why, you know, we talk about our own, our own why, but I just want to give you a little bit of context. Uh, with how purpose-driven messaging works and how important it is, you know, and, and in the corporate world, it means standing for something bigger than, you know, a company's products and services or a business's products and services. And it is, you know, it circles back to Simon Sinek. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And sometimes it's not even clear you know, you, you're at a crossroads and you're like, well, I, will, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know how to think of something I want to offer. Um, so that's why I beat this drum all the time, because you probably have things that you would love to help people with, problems that you would like to solve, but you fear-based thinking becomes front and center so early in the process that you talk yourself out of it before you even get started, right? Now, 80% of, of business leaders tell, tell, believe that purpose is central to a company's success, but only 27% of employee, I mean, this, this is from recent research and surveys, 27% of employees strongly believe in their company's values. So that's a pretty interesting piece of intel. And that tells us there's a big gap between what, what the, the worker bees are kind of feeling and what the leaders believe is important. So that also tells you that there's opportunity to be uh, be that person who is firmly rooted in a why, and that paves the way for growth. Whether it's a small business, your job in a big business, it's it's really it makes the difference often between success and lack of success. Now, you probably say, well, well you know, what does all that mean to me? Well, I just want to tell you a little quick thing about myself. So I started my career on Wall Street in the, in the 80s because it was what everybody sort of thought I should do because I had an economics degree, because I was, you know, I was a numbers person, I guess. I guess that's what people thought. And I was encouraged to go in this direction by family and advisors at college. So I got a job on Wall Street and I hated it. I hated it, but I didn't really hate finance. I didn't hate numbers. I just didn't want to be a Wall Street banker. And then I just stayed in the system and kept going from job to job to make more money and more money. And then it was difficult to, you know, pull that plug because, you know, I was a young woman living in New York making a lot of money, but I was not connected to a why. I had no connection to my work. I was just doing it. 
and feeling like, yeah, I was paying my bills and I was checking boxes, but I was not fulfilled at all. Now, I left that work uh, to become a writer and then had a son with special needs and in my life, you know, became extremely different. But the, the funny part is in the last five years, I went back to financial blogging. I, I married writing in finance and I became a financial blogger. And I realized I really did like my work. Why? I liked taking complicated data and, and articles from the Wall Street Journal and Forbes and Entrepreneur and all these places and condensing them into blogs that people could understand. That made me feel really connected to my why. I really, I really love that work. And then I, you know, went through my own personal struggles with fear and then took another step. So the point of sharing the story with you is to tell you that these are things that sometimes are not obvious for a while. And sometimes we don't even know what, what is interesting to us or the people, we don't even know who we want to help. So remaining open and curious and just kind of doing things, you know, dabbling in things can really help inform that. And that was my experience. Um, but, but like I said, the fear-based thinking can pop up and stop you before you even start. So that's why it's important that we, that we learn strategies to deal with that so that it doesn't get in our way and we can take that next step. So that's why I launched the Fear Finding Project. And when I did it, I got a lot of like fear in the headlights, kind of like, what are you doing? And why are you doing it? And how are you going to make money? Like so many people had like strange questions like that for me. And I knew what the why was. I wasn't 100% clear on the what and the how yet. So, but I just stayed rooted in that and started writing articles about what I knew targeted to the people that I wanted to help. And I just kept putting them anywhere I could put them. And then I started offering talks to anyone that would listen for free, any leadership group, any, anybody, whoever what for free, I just talked to anybody. And I, and then I went on LinkedIn and asked questions, you know, and I networked and then I, and slowly but surely, my what and how started to formulate. It was like, okay, you know, I had some individual coaching clients and that was okay. And they seemed to get something out of it and that was awesome. It didn't really spark me. So I kept working and talking to different people. So the point of all this is, is it is a journey. It is not clear at first. For those of you at the crossroads, curiosity is so crucial because it will You'll learn, you don't know what you don't know. We don't know what we don't know, right? So the, if you let fear hold you back from being curious and just asking the questions, you know, having coffee with people you don't know, asking them what their experience is with whatever the thing is that you're interested in, um, and, and just opening your mind and, and shifting out of some of that, that noise that holds you back, that's the first step and it doesn't cost you a thing. And you don't have to quit your job to do it, right? So I'm going to drill down a little bit more on this concept of why the why is so important because it, it puts you in a future state. It puts you in a growth mindset, on a path forward. You're expending energy to, to move forward instead of staying rooted in a fixed mindset, which is kind of binary thinking. I just have to do this job. I have to keep doing this job. If I, if I make a mistake, it's a, it's, it's a setback. Maybe I'm not meant to do this anymore. Like that kind of really, you know, um, black and white thinking as opposed to, hmm, that didn't work out so well. Um, let me try a different way and see how that goes. And that's growth mindset. And that puts you in future state thinking um, and gets you out of this, which is when you are so attached to outcome, that you fix yourself in that black and white thinking. Like, let me give you an example. Well, I can't do that because how would I make enough money to pay my bills? And then well, you go down the rabbit hole immediately without even, hmm, I wonder if I tried this while I have my other job, if I did this for a while, 
sort of, you know, to Yvonne's point, you know, she, it's passion project. And those passion projects can turn into bill paying projects. In, you know, if you're consistent with your growth mindset, finding out what works, experimenting with things, trying things, talking to people, being curious, then mindset becomes bigger than your attachment to outcome. Attachment to outcome can be a really discouraging and fear triggering uh, uh, focus. And what happens when we, when we stay in a fixed mindset instead of in that growth, why oriented mindset, then our, these are the kind of fears that, that get triggered, right? You're, am I gonna make enough money? Fear of rejection. What if, the, if one client doesn't, it doesn't go well? Oh my gosh, I'm not meant to do this. Instead of if one client doesn't go well, they were not intended to be my client. They were not my ideal client. I have to cast a wider net, you know? Fear of not growing my client base. That can just hamstring you, right? When you're so afraid of not growing it, you you guess what? You won't grow it. You know, how do I make connections? These are the kind of fears that can bubble up and then manifest in you become frozen, you can't make decisions, you lack confidence, you're stressed and anxious all the time, and then you don't have the energy to, to, to even try. So it's really, a, it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy and not a good one, and you can get firmly stuck. So fear is the fuel. Fear is the thing that you need to deconstruct to understand how you can make change, positive change for yourself. So you can shift your mindset. And once you do that and you practice doing it, then those, those empowering thoughts become stronger. Those neurons fire strongly and then are more apt to fire next time. It's science. I'm not making this up. You know, it's not my opinion. Um, and then no's become like not yet. And I'll give you a personal example. Uh, last week, I got a call from the producers at the Tamron Hall show. We want to talk to you. Yay. Had the Zoom call, then had another Zoom call with two more producers and talking about concept and the show where people were going to come talk about fear and how exciting, how wonderful. And then yesterday I was like, no, nope, they, they shelved it. Now, at the beginning of that process, you know, when I was, you know, figuring out what I was going to wear on the set, I was like, you better not attach the outcome here, Nancy. Because this is showbiz and it never, things don't go the way you, don't attach to outcome. And it helped me when they said, yeah, they, they sort of, it went in the garbage can, our, our idea. So, and, and instead I said, hmm, I had two calls with the producers at the Tamron Hall show. I'm going to stick with that. Because that's putting me forward instead of getting me stuck in what didn't happen. Make sense? And then you look at the world, you know, you look at your universe as potential partnerships. We don't get stuck in that, well, I have to do either this or this, Tina. I have to either choose this or that. Hmm, maybe I can sort of marry all of my skills together and, and form partnerships and collaborate with people. And then my business model will emerge. I'll discover it. Do it together beats do it alone every time. And particularly with women, I find that this is a very empowering place to be. We like to help each other and we reciprocate. You know, generally I have found that there's a lot of, of, of solidarity and there's a lot of sharing and there's a lot of support and networking in the, in the female business community. So, this is this is a, a wonderful way to embody that is by staying in that in that in that why. And then you be you can create a business that inspires not because you offer a service somebody needs just, but because you are staying connected to your bigger why. And then you draw the right clients toward you. You draw the right collaboration toward you. People find you. Uh, because you're speaking from a place that's real. You're operating from a place that's grounded in authenticity, not to overuse an overused word, but, but it is 
through and people can sniff it out. So how do you get that mindset, right? How do you do it? Uh, it sounds good, you know, but that's what we're gonna, we're gonna work on now. Before we do that, does anybody have any questions or comments they wanna share before we get into how to, how to get that mindset? No, okay. I'm gonna teach you a strategy that I teach in my course um, and I teach in client workshops all the time and to college students, I, when I speak to college entrepreneurship classes, this is a, a favorite one. It's called the fear to want strategy. So remember when I asked you to write down your fear, I'm gonna check time. Malu, tell me if I'm running out of time. Re remember when um, I asked you, to, I'm good? Yeah, it's 12.50, so you have 10 more. Okay. So that fear you, you wrote down, I'm going to ask you to rewrite it in the form of a want. Instead of, I am afraid that I want to, blah, blah, blah. What happens? A lot happens when you do that. Neuroscientifically, a lot happens when you do that. When you are feeling, speaking, thinking a fear-based thought, you're in victim mindset, you're in defense. You're expending energy to protect yourself. It's negative, your, your thoughts are negative and you're kind of in fixed mindset. When you reword it into a want, you are suddenly shifting and firing different neurons. You are in positive intentional mindset, purpose-driven mindset, and you're on offense instead of defense. So you're expending energy to move yourself forward in growth mindset. So this is a powerful strategy for reframing fear-based thoughts. So take the fear that you wrote, write it into a want, and when I do this with, with college students, particularly, I love watching the process because they physically change. You know, they lean in, they sit up straight, they say the want. And sometimes it brings them to tears because they realize what they're capable of. And also they realize what they do to themselves on a fairly regular basis, right? By, by letting these fear-based thoughts bubble up and keep them from doing things. Here's an example, I have to move. Sorry about this little, little blue thing, but I have to move the, I'm afraid my business won't grow and become irrelevant. The want would be, I want to continue to grow my business with integrity and resolve. It feels different in your body and your body processes it differently, fact. So who wants to share theirs? I can't wait to hear. I'm gonna call on you so you might just as well I'll start. Um, so when I switched careers, it was, and I still have this fear is that I'm too old. You know, I'm in my mid sixties and, you know, that's just always been hanging over me as women. I think a lot of us experience that probably starting in our late forties, but anyway, I'm really old. <laughs> so with that fear being said, I just like, when I turn it into a one, it's like, I want to make the best use of the time that I have left while working. I mean, that really feels different. It, it totally changes my perspective. It's a great exercise. And it changes your brain chemistry and your wiring. And you're not old because and <laughs> if you're old, then I'm old and I am not copying to being old. So just, I'm, we're not even going to keep that in the recording. Okay. Who's next? So Thank I just you. want to tell Anne that Anne, you're not old. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've sat here and my programming days from IBM years ago, I've done a cloud in my house. I did my own website. I mean, believe me, it's experience. And my thing right now is to give back and build on my parents' legacy. And so, that's right. So there's a fear and a want right there. I'm afraid I'm too old, blah, blah, blah. I want to share my rich experience and wisdom. Mm -hmm. Feels different. All of a sudden, like the S is on your chest and you got the whole thing going on. So and just just one other thing. <laughs> yes. I, I coached a young lady and I she had an interview. And this morning, my first email was that she got the job she wanted, that she interviewed for. That was the first email I did. Her resume, cover letter, 90 second speech, everything. And she got the job. See that? So we give back. 
and people, the younger folks benefit. They really, really do. And, and to piggyback on that, when we teach the younger people, that's why I talk to college students, because if we can perpetuate this thinking in them, it will, right, it will continue. I, I'm so, I, my why is to reduce suffering. My why is not to teach people strategies in a digital course. It's to reduce the suffering because there's a lot of suffering. So, okay. So um, who else? Anybody else want to, oops, I didn't, sorry. Anybody else want to share there? Yes, Yvonne. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll say uh, my fear is that I'm afraid I will always struggle with money. And uh, to reframe that, I want to say, I love yours. First of all, I want to continue to grow my business with integrity and resolve because it Tidally says what I'm saying here, which is I want to come up with a valuable offer or service so that I can support my family. Um, yeah. And you can. Yeah, I've got the why. I don't know the what and the how, but that's where it, I'm. Uh, so let me just say, I mean, I stood in front of a, a, a poster board with sticky notes for probably a good hour in a seminar with people I didn't know, and I wasn't even sure I was why I was there, and just kept writing things on sticky notes. And the person that was mentoring me was like, well, who who do you wanna help? And, and I had all these lofty, like multi-layered things. She kept saying, why, why, why? Like she was poking me, why? And then, at, sorry, dog. And at the end of all of that, it was like, I don't, I wanna help. Everybody's afraid. She's like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. So it's 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 not easy to get to that one sentence elevator pit. It's not easy to do that. It's one of the hardest things to do. But once you do it, then you're fishing instead of getting handed a fish every time. Get the elevator pitch, the one sentence, who you want to help, what you want to help them with, and then you then you can work forward for that. And Yvonne, we can talk about that offline. All right, anybody else before? Um, we start to wrap. Julie, do you have any anything you wanna, a fear you wanna share with into a want with us? Okay, that's okay. Um, Tina. I'm sorry, I can hear um, you. Oh, that's okay, Julie, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, Tina, to interrupt you. Um, no, no, no. Do you, I, do you... Well, I think mine is like more stemmed with like, one of those like major beliefs like I'm afraid I'll never feel like I'm good enough and I want to feel like I'm capable and confident to provide for myself and for other people yeah and you may not be surprised to hear that I hear this a lot so know with 150 percent certainty that you are enough exactly as you are what gets in our way is noise, chatter. And the noise and chatter in our heads that tell us to question whether we're good enough, to question whether we can do the thing, to question our value in whatever way we define value, you have practiced for years and years. And with practice, you get really good at those thoughts and your brain gets really automatic with those thoughts but know that that can change. And it's a matter of practicing, you know, strategies, much like the fear to want strategy, doing things consistently. Something, another thing that I teach is a word bath exercise where I actually have people describe themselves in a list of words, a thing, the ick feelings, the worst feelings you have, um, you know, inadequate, uh, um, not confident, um, small, afraid, shy, quiet, whatever they are. And then take that word, the opposite of that word times 20 and make a list of those words and recite them to yourself two times a day, once a day, two times a week, whatever you can do, but do it. Neurologically, you change. So these things are just a matter of practicing, practicing and practicing some more because practice makes possibility, does not make perfect makes possibility. It opens up your brain, you experience your life differently. And it's not about trying to be happy. 
It's about changing your inner dialogue, changing the relationship you have with yourself. You can do it now and know that it is possible. That That is an important thing to know. Virginia, are you going to share a fear to want? Um, sure. I I guess my, my fear that I wrote down was, you know, will I be able, do I have the energy uh, to do, you know, what I need to do to take this to the next level or, um, and it, you know, it's, a lot of it is about also, you know, maintaining my healthy mindset and, you know, not burning out and not, you know, which I've done many times in my, in my history and my career. Um, so I'm, I'm fearful about that. And so maybe, you know, it's more like I want to find a way to advance, you know, what I'm trying to achieve while maintaining my, um, my health, my mental, my mental integrity, you know, and not over, over burning out. And it's, it's, it feels good to say it that way. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but typically it feels better to say it that way, right? Because then it's like, how do I, not how can I, you know, it's like, how do I? Curiosity. Let me ask questions. Let me join a networking group. Let me talk to other women who might be dealing with this. And then your nervous system experiences it differently. Your whole body experiences it differently. And we just have to keep chipping away and practicing these things so we don't knee jerk back to the fear-based thoughts that just keep us at, like the orange people, remember? like just, and, and I know because I was there, so it is possible, it just takes time. And I hope that, you know, we were able to, through this exercise, you were able to sort of get a glimpse of what you can do and how this isn't woo-woo. This isn't like, you know, wishful thinking. This is just doing things to, to change your thoughts, practicing those strategies and, and sticking with it and being consistent. Um, so I think we're out of time. Um, you can find me on my website. This is... Uh, my page for my course that just launched on Monday, uh, and I am, you can enroll this week at an introductory price. If you want more information, go there, but also feel free to just uh, email me directly at explore at nancyrburger.com, visit my website, read more about what I do, and please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions about today, you want to just have a, a quick chat on the phone to dig into something uh, that's unique to you, whatever, I'm happy to do it for the Haven people. So um, feel free to do that. And I wanna thank you for your attention and for coming. Uh, Malou? Thank you so much, Nancy. We enjoyed having you. Oh my gosh, I'm just taking a lot of like phone notes here, but it was super helpful and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Yeah, I love talking about this stuff. Could do it all day. Thanks ladies, <laughs> go get them. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.